and the work that's been done in the series. Now, as a reminder, all of our WLP sessions, as you just heard, are recorded and live streamed to our Facebook page and will be available for later viewing afterwards, including the program's materials. Now, tonight, we have a very special guest, and we're excited to welcome back Crystal Kai, Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and a previous WLP speaker, as well as Congressman Judy Chu and Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus to deliver opening remarks and kick off this year's series. Following the opening remarks, we'll proceed with today's session, the AA and NHPI Diaspora immigration and intergenerational experiences. This session will focus on the complexities and disparities that exist within our community and teach us how to be empowered by our identities that are shaped by immigration and intergenerational experiences. Our panelists will respond to the audience Q&A at the end, so keep those questions in mind. You can follow and join our conversation tonight on social media using the hashtag, hashtag WeAreCapal. And again, I want to thank our speakers and panelists this evening for spending their time with us and to all of you for joining us tonight. And a very special thank you to our 2022 sponsors for making programs like tonight possible. Now, I'm very honored to introduce Crystal to kick off WLP. Crystal is the Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Asian American State of Hawaiian Pacific Islanders and the President Advisory Commission on AA and HPI. Prior to joining Wenapi, Crystal worked on Capitol Hill for over a decade, including serving as the executive director of KPAC for eight years. Crystal was born and raised in Hawaii and is the first Native Hawaiian to ever leave Wenapi. Crystal, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Colby, and aloha, everyone. So great to be here with you today. As the executive director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, or what we call Wianpi, it is truly an honor to be here to kick off Kapal's Washington Leadership Program Series and also to be able to share the stage with my former boss, uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu, who is chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Since its founding in 1989, Kapal has helped to build a pipeline for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in public policy and public service. And I wanna congratulate all of this year's Kapal interns and scholars, as well as all of our summer interns from various programs who are participating in this year's Washington Leadership Program. Like many of you um, and many folks who, who work in DC, um, my career in public service actually began with a summer internship a long time ago. And because of that, I know how valuable programs like WLP are in helping to provide a constructive community-oriented professional network for our AA and NHPI communities to plug into, um, which is really more critical now than ever as our communities continue to face a multitude of challenges that have been exacerbated over the past two and a half years of the COVID-19 pandemic including the rise in anti-Asian violence and hate. Although I did not personally go through the Kapal program, I have benefited tremendously from the pipeline of bright and talented individuals who attribute their careers in public service to Kapal. And prior to being appointed to the Biden-Harris administration last July, I worked on Capitol Hill, as I mentioned um, previously, where I had the honor of working very closely with Kapal in my role as executive director of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and participating on prior WLP panels that were held in the US Capitol. And over the years, I've made it a point to bring in Kapal interns and scholars onto my teams, um, dating back to my time on Capitol Hill, where several of my previous staff hires were individuals who had gone through the Kapal program and were so impressive that I knew I had to hire them right away. Um, I'm also very fortunate that in my current role with the White House Initiative, I continue to benefit from Kapal's tremendous legacy through another one of your esteemed alumni, Rebecca Lee, who is a former Kapal scholar and Kapal board chair who serves as the deputy director of our White House Initiative. And um, we know that, you know, just from these very few examples, I can tell you that there is no doubt in my mind that Kapal is truly helping to equip future Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander leaders with the important skills that will benefit you both throughout your summer internships as well as in your future careers. And this work is, as I mentioned earlier, more important now than ever. And it's why that I am so grateful to be able to serve in an administration and under a president and a vice president who truly value our communities. Um, and that is why last May during Asian American Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, President Biden signed Executive Order 14031 to reestablish the White House Initiative and the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and to ensure that we were 
and promoting a whole of government approach to advancing equity, justice, and opportunity for our diverse Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. And you know, for me personally, as someone who grew up in Hawaii, who is um, both the daughter of a Native Hawaiian father as well as an immigrant mother from Japan, um, I truly understand how important and how rich and diverse and vibrant our communities are, but also how uniquely um, challenging so many of the needs our communities um, face um, have been and how unfortunately they have not always been prioritized um, by our federal government. So to be able to work in administration that truly values equity and has really made it a point to ensure that we are doing all that we can to um, address a number of longstanding inequities that have long hindered our communities, whether we're talking about the need for greater health equity, educational equity, economic equity, and of course, addressing the horrific tide in anti-Asian violence and hate. So I just want all of you to know that our White House initiative and President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders is here as a resource to all of you. We hope that we will have an opportunity to work with many of you over the course of the next few months during your summer internships. I know that um, a number of you are interning in federal agencies, so we do hope that we'll be able to connect. And um, just really excited about the future, the bright future that all of you have ahead. Um, we know that public service is such valuable and inspiring work. Um, it is not a traditional field of a career path for, I think, many of the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community. Um, but one thing I just really want to highlight is something that the vice president has made very clear that although she's the first, you know, she certainly will not be the last. And I think, um, unfortunately, many of us in the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community in D.C. have oftentimes been in rooms where we are the only Asian American um, or NHPI in the room. And, you know, knowing how important it is to be able to have that representation and to bring our perspectives and our voices to the work that we do. So I just want to, again, commend all of you, congratulate you on your exciting um, summer internships ahead. And I just hope that you know that your presence here this summer and the work that you are doing um, is truly helping to build a stronger pipeline and make a difference for our community um, for generations to come. So thank you so much. And I will turn it back over to Colby. Thank you so much, Crystal. It means so much to Kapal uh, for you to join us tonight and to share your wisdom and to share your experience. So thank you so much. Now, before I hand it off to our moderator, I would like to share a special message by Representative Judy Chu. Congresswoman Chu was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in July 2009. She represents the 27th Congressional District, which includes Pasadena and the West San Gabriel Valley of Southern California. Rep Chu currently serves on the powerful House and Ways Means Committee and also serves on the House Small Business Committee. In 2009, she became the first Chinese American woman elected to Congress in history. Hello, I'm Congressmember Judy Chu, and as the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or what we call KPAC, I am thrilled to be kicking off this year's Washington Leadership Program at today's opening ceremony. Thank you to the Conference on Asian Pacific American Leadership for inviting me to join you all today. It's so important to me to have an organization like Kapal working to introduce young Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander students to public service and community engagement. And I'm so proud of the work you've accomplished through your annual Washington Leadership Program Series to help educate young leaders about some of the most important issues that are facing our communities and the importance of representation in public service. You see, as a young girl myself, I never actually thought I would be in elected office, let alone a member of Congress. It is because I never saw anyone who looked like me in such positions, so it never even occurred to me that it was a possibility. But I'll never forget the day after my election when President Obama called me from the White House to congratulate me on becoming the first Chinese American woman elected to Congress in history. And thankfully, I am not alone. There was a time when AAPIs were so invisible in the nation's capital that if you saw someone walking down the halls, you just had to turn around and look. It was so unusual. But thankfully, that is no longer the case. Today, we have a record 21 AAPI members of Congress, our highest number ever. But representation goes beyond just my fellow members of Congress. We must continue building our public service pipeline and make sure that our communities are represented at all levels, from the White House to the halls of Congress, especially amongst our congressional staff and interns. 
And that is why I'm so grateful for organizations like Kapal for inspiring more young leaders like all of you to get involved in public service. And I have promoted the inclusion of AAPI leaders at every level of government. After President Biden was elected, I immediately urged him to appoint qualified AAPIs, not only as part of this commitment to ensuring a government that looked like our country, but also so that we could be sure our voices were being included in important policy discussions. And I'm so proud that the president has appointed incredible leaders like Dr. Vivek Murthy as Surgeon General and Julie Su as the Deputy Secretary of Labor. But our focus can't just be at the top. We need more AAPIs at every level to fill the pipeline so that there are more leaders ready to step up when an opportunity arises. People like Ambassador Catherine Tai. Catherine was someone I got to know through my work on the Ways and Means Committee where she was a staffer who helped us with trade issues. As a congressional staffer, Catherine was far from the limelight, but she worked hard and became a trusted expert to all of us on the committee. And because of that, when President Biden began assembling his cabinet, Catherine's name quickly gained attention. And now, as the U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine went from Capitol Hill staffer to being one of the highest ranking AAPIs in the country as a member of the president's cabinet. By being engaged in programs like these, you can gain invaluable insight into not just the inner workings of our federal government, but also the importance of having AAPIs at the table when decisions are being made. And eventually, because of the steps you're taking today, by participating in the Washington Leadership Program, you could have a seat at that table yourselves. And that is why I'm so thrilled to see all of you here spending your time learning about issues that are so important to our communities from immigration and representation in the media to public health and educational equity for AAPIs. So thank you again to Kapal for providing spaces like this for our next generation of leaders and for inviting me to join you today. I wish you all a great summer of learning about our communities. Thank you to the Congresswoman for her message. And um, the Congresswoman mentioned Catherine Tai as an appointee and Vivek Murthy and, and so many leaders like Crystal who are part of the administration and leading today and leaders of the past who have uh, made their imprint upon, upon government and public service. I would be remiss if I didn't mention also Kapal's own Chantal Wong, who was appointed US Director and Ambassador to the Asia Development Bank uh, Chantal and a group of friends founded Kapal nearly 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And with that, I think it is now time to welcome our panel. So please give a warm welcome to our moderator, Sean Gadwell, who's the current Vice President of Programs at Asian and Pacific Islander Scholars, APIA Scholars, will be our moderator for this panel. Sean will be leading the discussion and our Q&A uh, afterwards. Sean, over to you. Thank you so much, Kobe, and thank you, um, Crystal, and uh, what a very inspiring opening for the um, Washington Leadership Program. Um, you know, and I just want to say it's such an honor to be with with you all today, um, all you Kapal members, all you, all, every you, all of you participating in the program. It's clear that you're building an amazing, strong leadership pipeline. And this network that you're building this summer will be your colleagues in the future. So uh, thank you for offering your talents and roles in the, in, in the roles that you hold this summer. So my job as moderator is to have, is to do my best so that we have a really rich conversation about our two topics uh, or two topics that are related or could be seen a little separate um, in terms of like immigration and intergenerational experiences. And so um, what a lovely topic to kick off the Washington Leadership Program, um, because we know that, you know, we we have roots in the immigration in terms of our our families and, our, and some of our families coming over and living here uh, in the United States. But we also have that intergenerational experience where um, people between different generations, we've been here for a while. 
you know? And so um, what a great topic to kick this off. And so to level set and, and to start the conversation, I'm gonna drop two definitions into the chat, one for immigration and one for intergenerational experiences. Um, and so as you read those and as you're considering them, like feel free to add your thoughts to it, but I'm going to now like bring on the panel and so that they can introduce themselves. And so um, we'll go to the panelists and I'll ask you panelists if you could share your name, the organization you're affiliated with. And then as you read these definitions about immigration or intergenerational experiences, how do they connect with you? Do they, do they work? Um, are there anything you would like to add or, can, or any other considerations as we start this conversation? All right. Um, I have Dale, you're, on, you're first on my list, so I'll pass it over to you. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel with Kapal. And uh, my name is Dale Assis. I'm the finance director at the uh, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. It's a, it's a uh, nonprofit uh, in Chicago that's uh, talking about working with intergenerational experiences and uh, other cultures as well. It's mostly African-American and uh, Latinx communities that I work with, and I'm the finance director of an environmental justice organization. And I've been working in uh, the public service for over 25 years. Awesome, thank you, Dale. Um, we'll, we'll go with Vanessa, who, who's, no, who's no stranger to WLP and Kapal. Hello, Talo um, Falava Malolele. Um, my name is Vanessa Tufanga, and I'm calling in from Anchorage, Alaska, otherwise known as um, the Dena'ina land, the land of the Athabascan people. Um, I actually, um, I'm a Kapal alum. I was in the 2021 SNI. Um, I'm also a board member and co-treasurer of the Pacific Community of Alaska, so for short PCA, and then I'm also a member of the Data and Research Committee um, in Naopo, which is the Nas National Associate Association, Association, while I cannot speak today, of Pacifica Organization. Um, and I'm really glad to be here because it's pretty cool uh, being from watching the panels to now being a part of one, so thank you for having me. Welcome, Vanessa. Yes, so great uh, to have you back. And Lee, want to close us out? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Lee. I am a politics reporter with Vox, where I focus on Congress and elections, and that's included covering Asian American political power and activism as well. Super excited to be here and talk with everyone um, and really interested to talk about how immigration policy and many of these other issues have shaped Asian American experiences in the U.S. Amazing. Thank you, Lee. Um, well, let's get right into it. So we have these two ideas, immigration and intergenerational experiences. Um, so we'll start with you, Vanessa. Um, how do you think these two ideas are related? Um, are they related? Uh, what's your thought on sort of how one might affect another? And panelists, as you hear other as you hear Vanessa's answer, feel free to chime in or piggyback on anything she might say. I think immigration and intergener intergenerational experiences are related because, well, I think one thing that we all have in common is that we all have an ancestor or a parent who had all immigrated here. And then they had an experience in which then, so I'm second generation, um, so I'm not technically an immigrant, but my grandparents are. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of their immigration experiences um, have a lot to do with the way that um, my intergenerational experiences are then formed. Um, and I, I guess when I saw that question, that's kind of what I thought the connection was in there. Um, there's a lot of deeper things that we experience. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to the Pacific Islander experience um, because it does vary from, again, the Asian experience. We do have similarities, but there are distinctive differences. Um, so I would say that in, uh, as a response to that question. Yeah. Um, are, is there anything in particular that you think about in terms of how they overlap? Um, um like particular, what do you mean? Like from your, um, like you, you said, like, you know, you're second generation immigrant, 
um, or is there like lessons or thoughts from um, your grandparents or anything like that that you kind of still carry over or how you how you might even see yourself as second generation immigrant? Um, I think that there is, I think one experience that I have is, so my grandparents still very strong in the culture, but a lot of assimilation um, had happened. So like there are parts of the culture that we lost in order to fit in to like the American standard, mm. but also recognizing that that has a lot to do with survival. Um, so I would say that like, we do carry our traditions over still and like, I mean, when it comes to Pacific Islander, like dancing or so songs and singing, talk story type thing, um, we still have those things, but it probably is vastly different in comparison to uh, when my grandparents like first came to America. And like, yeah. like for example, I, like language, I don't quite understand it, um, but I'm reteaching myself and like my grandparents are fluent. So I guess that, that'd be an ex uh, example. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for kicking us off, Vanessa, uh, and just getting into that sort of the idea of assimilation and culture. I know for me too, like, you know, I've had people tell me, including family members, like, you're losing your culture. And I'm like, well, I'm starting something new. So <laughs> there's that tension that exists. What do, uh, oh, I just noticed that uh, we're joined by Dr. Bennett. Dr. Bennett, who's in the midst of traveling, um, is also one of our panelists. So let's pause and introduce uh, Dr. Bennett. Do you, would you like to introduce yourself? your name and, and the organization that um, you're, you're a part of. Sure, um, oh, I just saw the chat. Thanks everyone. Um, half a day, my name is Dr. Jesse Lujan Bennett. And uh, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you all um, for the opportunity to talk. Uh, the Washington Leadership Program is just so nice to, to join you all. I didn't think I'd be able to make it in person, in person. Um, so this is really nice to be able to join you all live, live from the field. Um, so speaking of diasporic experiences, I'm trying to get from, I live in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I'm trying to get, get to Guam. And um, because of COVID, it's been an interesting routing. So I'm, I'm still here in New Zealand and I'm very happy to join you all. I work at the uh, University of Waikato here in Kirikiriroa, Hamilton um, in New Zealand. I am a professor in Pacific and Indigenous Studies within the larger faculty of Maori and Indigenous Studies. So my um, work is grounded in the Pacific, and a lot of my research looks at uh, diasporic experiences, specifically of Chamorros, so the indigenous peoples of the Mariana Islands. And my family is from Guam, also known as Guahan, from the villages of Dededo and Barragada. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for joining us um, from New Zealand and um, a lot of different time zones. I, what time is it over there in New Zealand? It is 10, 26 a.m. on a very um, cloudy <laughs> and cold autumn, almost winter-ish kind of morning. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. And I, we hope you're able to find your way to Guam soon. Um, yeah, hopefully tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, hopefully tomorrow. Um, all right, let's, let's jump back into the conversation. Um, Vanessa was just sharing a little bit about culture and assimilation and that being sort of like something um, where she saw immigration and, inter and intergenerational experience, intergenerational experiences sort of like coming ahead. What about other other panelists? Like what other examples do you see um, in, in terms of immigration and intergenerational experiences like overlapping or uh, being related to each other? I think a lot of, uh... Uh, especially second generation Asian American experiences suffer from a profound assimilation to fit in, just like Vanessa said, uh, not just by survival, but the strong inclination to fit in and that uh, assimilation, you know, you forget the language, you forget the, the cultural values, you forget the food. Uh, and that uh, and and that's discarded in the past, but uh, but no matter I, in my personal experience, no matter how tr hard I try to assimilate, I am still considered the other, and that I've learned to have peace in in uh, accepting myself, Shyam, in in this. Uh, yes, I'm the other, but at the same time, I'm American. I um I bring a different set of values to 
to this fabric, but at the same time, I'm also unique myself. I think I think this 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 uh, this this thread of being comfortable, of uh, being different, but being part of it, is is like a a big solid dance I've been playing all my life. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Dell. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, me like Crystal was mentioning, being the only one in the room, and then trying to fit in to be like, okay, if I do this and do this, well, then I'd be able to get my like point across. But ultimately, it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, others. I do think an experience uh, which. Dale touched on that transcends generations is the experience with xenophobia that's deeply rooted in immigration policy and in US history and just how um, our government has treated Asian Americans and also um, the unique experiences that Pacific Islanders have had too with colonialism um, that are different but are tied to some of the same issues. Um, I'll jump in on that. I, I think that's a great point with um, speaking as a, a Pacific person. Um, sometimes there's overlap with, I, I think, maybe Asian experiences, but because of the kind of colonial situations many of our islands are, are in and historically have been in with the United States, it makes our movement and experiences in the continental U.S. quite different in some cases. So at least for my family and what I've experienced and thinking of, of my mom and my grandma, a lot of it has been around hyper invisible hyper invisibility um, in ways where, for example, to say that I'm Chamorro, folks don't know what that means in the States, even though the Mariana Islands, and I would argue Guam specifically, is one of the most important kind of um, strategic military locations for the US, yet people don't know of our islands. So when we say Chamorro, it just kind of falls on deaf ears. So to tell people where we're from ends up being more of a history lesson, which, is a whole kind of labor in onto itself. Um, so for some folks, including my grandma and my mom, when they left the islands, they're at a moment where there was so much immigration to our, our island and they're trying to find a cohesive way of talking about the, the pol politics of the space. Um, people were adopting terms like Guamanian, which kind of um, erases the, the indigenous populations within our islands, right? So when we come over to the United States, a lot of folks are still saying Guamanian in hopes that someone will hear the word Guam in there. Um, but half the time, no one knows what that means either. So growing up, I would, I'd say I'm Guamanian and they're like, well, what? So at the end of the day, my grandma's like, we should have just said tomorrow all along. And, and we don't have to do these like extra bits of song and dance for people. Like we all have access to the internet and there's no reason in 2022 that I have to continuously give a history lesson to help Americans specifically like locate our islands because it's not at least here in New Zealand, I'm finding that people know where our islands are, but it's this kind of hyper invisibility that I feel and experience um, stateside. And I think my grandmother and my mom had to deal a lot with that, being mistaken for other kinds of ethnic groups, um, but being very staunch about, no, we are from this particular place. We are of that land. Let me tell you about where we're from. Yeah. <laughs> that it's uh, right like in terms of just uh in a lot of different ways of you know like now we're at a point where access to information is 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 there and and what does it mean to um yeah just be who you are um and let and let the other like let uh, other folks kind of like do some of that work and labor um some of the some of you all have been sort of talking about it, but maybe not getting hitting it right away. Um, but I want to shout out Michelle, who sh shared a little bit into the chat to us. And you all are more than welcome to engage with us, with the hosts and the panelists. Um, and feel free to drop in your questions. Um, but one thread that Michelle pointed out was um, intergenerational trauma. And so building off some of the ideas like xenophobia and colonialism, um, is that something that can get passed down um, and if and how have you all seen it perhaps um, yeah. um I'll share an experience and answer that question um I shared this uh experience with a couple of people this past weekend um and it, do, it has to do with 
my grandpa. So um, my grandpa, when he first moved to America, he spoke fluent Samoan. He had moved from American Samoa, which is, well, if you know, you know. Um, but anyways, he had moved to uh, California in elementary school. And when he had moved there, he um, had seen people laughing at him when he was speaking. And when that had happened, he had pretty much told us, me and my siblings and, and my dad, that he had vowed to himself that he wouldn't teach us Samoan because he had experienced that and it hit him so hard. And I think that has a lot to do with intergenerational trauma. And he passed that down to us where we don't speak our language fluently. And I'm a deep believer in the fact that language has everything to do with culture. Um, and you understand culture on a different level when you speak the language. And I think missing that, that element of culture has, has made a huge impact on, on my family and how we exist with our culture, our relationship with that. And then also um, the other culture, which is American culture and how we exist there. So I think that that, when I thought of intergenerational trauma, I thought that, um, so yeah. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa, for, for sharing that story and, and being open and vulnerable, thank you. Um, yeah, and the, and then the sort of like intersection of language, right, and how that plays a role um, for some folks, whether they're they know whether they may not have had the chance to learn their native language, or they come to America with their native language, but then having to um, learn English. Any of the panelists want to talk about language and how that um, intersects with immigration or immigrant experiences? Um, I guess I'll, I'll speak to Vanessa's um, point about language. Um, so in the northern half of the Pacific, um, just to give some context for folks, um, most of our islands have some kind of colonial relationship with the United States. So the ways in which our, our immigrant story, immigrant stories are shaped actually calls into question, are we immigrants because of the citizenship that was kind of thrust upon our islands and the lack of real choice in that kind of relationship. But I will say in terms of language, um, because of these kind of colonial relationships, islands like the Marianas, Guam, um, you know, folks like my grandmother had real um, kinds of language policies that were put into place on island that prohibited them from, from speaking the language um, on our own island. So there were things like being physically reprimanded in school, um, starting the day off with a ticket. And if you hear other children speaking tomorrow as a little kid, you would give the ticket to the other kid. And at the end of the day, whoever had that ticket um, would have to pay money to the school. And so this, this kind of policing amongst Chamorro kids to make it where English is the dominant language. And then the, I mean, there's all sorts of um, assimilationist policies that were put into place, but had detrimental effects on our, our language today. And so that's part of the reason why I'm trying to get to Guam right now is for an immersion program because of the ways that our, our language has been devalued um, over time because of what was like pushed on the island as being worthy, what was valuable to speak, um, that you couldn't speak more than one language, it was English or nothing. And that kind of mindset then travels in some cases with our families as we move and many of our pathways to the US is still tied to colonialism, like the militarization of our islands. So you see people like my grandma, very regretful of like not sharing in the same ways that maybe you know, I would have had hoped and my mom having very conversational kinds of skills of Chamorro, but both of them going, you know, why don't we speak it? And it's great that you're getting into it now. But when it comes to the loss of language to bring something back to go from in danger to living again is takes generations, it could be a generation to put us in an endangered space. And now it's taking generations to bring it back. So I think as um, for us as like diasporic folks, it language is still accessible to us when we have these grandparents around and our parents and community members who are so hungry to connect in many ways and share what they know. And also things like Zoom make it where um, folks like myself had had, I've had a lot of access to tomorrow language resources and chat groups and things like that because of this, this format. So that's a long winded way of saying I agree with Vanessa that um, there's a lot of trauma that has been tied to our languages and the choosing or not to choose to speak it within the home or to have it move through the generations because of colonial traumas within our islands. Oh, wow. Um, wow. I, I had to write that down, Dr. Bennett. Um, 
going from endangered to living takes generations, right? And so, um, Oh, what it's it's for me it's calling into me like asking like well you know what 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 do I need to ensure that's living um when it comes to my my culture um and and how's that gonna look generations from, from now that that was deep <laughs> um all right we're getting some questions in so that's that's good um we can we can go there. Let's do one like a little bit zoomed out question and then we can go to some of the questions in case that um, in case that sparks some ideas. Um, so yes, we've been talking about the ANHPI community, the ANHPI diaspora. Um, but what what are you what are your thoughts around immigration and intergenerational experiences on this larger, and we know that it's so hard it's so hard to kind of like pinpoint just one or a couple things about our community. So let's not even try to do that. Um, but just like your, your, your thoughts on what, what does the idea of immigration and intergeneration experiences mean for the broader a HPI community? And Lee, we can start with you. Um, I definitely think it, immigration has shaped so much of, um, you know, the dynamics that our community have experienced um, broadly over time. And to Michelle's earlier point, I think one of the um, elements that, you know, is often erased in the U.S. Um, and in U.S. history is um, U.S. involvement in wars in, in Asia, um, obviously colonialism as well um, against Pacific Islanders. Um, but that being a huge struggle that immigrants have to deal with when they come to the US because um, the country doesn't want to acknowledge its responsibility in perpetuating trauma against other people. Um, and when you are taught in history classes, you're, you're taught that the US is kind of the savior um, when that just honestly doesn't acknowledge this role. Um, and I think for immigrants, you know, when I've done reporting to negotiate that tension is difficult. And it's like uh, one that you're continuing to have to negotiate even if you're not a first generation immigrant as well. Yeah, Maybe Shia, I'd like to contribute the, the connections between uh, immigration and intergenerational experiences. I'd like to maybe point to many of the Kapal uh, participants uh, to pinpoint the role of history uh, between the connection between immigration experiences and intergenerational uh, experiences and immigration and trauma. I think, uh, and so I know many of the Kapal um, folks that are in the call are not only to see it in the in the current lens of today, uh, but also to expand to a much broader context of what immigration has done and change and and, the, and these and the, the perceptions of positive and negative comes and goes and ebbs over time uh, from 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 Dr. Bennett with the Chamorro and the connection of American imperialism and the and that history of expansionism of that time of eating up all these Pacific islands from American Samoa to Guam to Hawaii, right? And even the Philippines at that time, the American expansionism movement. And that at the same time, our first speaker with, uh, with Congressperson Chu speaking, and we we're proud of being the first Chinese American uh, uh, con Congressperson now, but 150 years ago, Cheyenne, they were not Chinese, we're not allowed, we're disallowed by Congress and the Supreme Court to even come to the United States. And, and they were treated, I'm sorry, they feel like dogs, right? And that's maybe the root of what Lee's saying about xenophobia. But, but that, that's, but there, it, so, so I mean, this comes and goes, but during the 60s, you know, uh, uh, Chinese and the Japanese were considered 
the new heroes of the 20th century, right, of, of, of the rising economies, e even just a few years before the Trump administration. So it, it, it does ebb and flow, but I want to pinpoint the ebb of history, but also to pin the point in the white elephant in the room of racism, what that's it's the root cause of the xenophobia that we have mentioned at the top of the hour. Yeah, thank you, Dale. Um, yeah, definitely, history definitely ebbs and flows, um, and you can you can definitely see the sort of like where the tides take us. Um, yeah, any reactions or thoughts from the other panelists about what Dale just shared about the connections of the ebbs and flows of the of the history and the generation, and but it also coming back to either xenophobia or colonialism. That's cool. <laughs> um, I, I guess I can, I can hop in just to yeah. say that that was um, great. Thanks for sharing that. But I think xenophobia and colonialism, I think it goes hand in hand in this idea of like, who's a desirable American, like who can be fully incorporated um, into this. Yeah, who's desirable and who is not. And we see it play out in immigration policies over time. We see it in the ways that some of our islands are still colonies where we're unincorporated. So we're not fully a part of of the United States and the constitution sometimes applies and sometimes it does not. Um, so I, I think while those, those concepts might seem very distant in some cases, I, I see the processes and, and these ideas actually very intrinsically tied, like who, who's worthy of being American, who is, um, who's a desirable candidate to be a part of this nation, and then who is good enough in some cases and sometimes not, yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, we have some questions in the chat and I'm happy to open it up to anyone in the panel. Um, let's, let's start with this question because I think this relates to a lot of the audience in terms of the work that you're taking on as interns this summer. Um, for, uh, so the idea that um, you know, some of our guests or attendees are gonna be are doing important research and policy work um, but acknowledging the fact that the AH, AA and NHPI communities, um, how, how do you hold that tense, tension in your own work about the fact that each group has its own um, sort of like unique experiences, uh, but we're still sometimes being forced to produce research that um, can inform policy? How do you all um, navigate that tension or how have you seen others navigate that tension? I think for me, uh, the biggest thing is probably just being honest about it and and saying that it exists. Um, and I think um, I'm sure a lot of people on this call are familiar with this push for data disaggregation and um, wanting to be able to say, yes, there is strength in solidarity, in political power as APIs, but also that individual groups within the API community have very specific needs, that there's huge differences in you know, um, education and healthcare needs, and that that's really important for policymakers to acknowledge. I think the biggest mistake is trying to say that there is a monolithic community, um, as we all know. And um, I think it's kind of, it's a little bit disheartening how long it's taken to get to this point of trying to be able to break information out, even just like basic data about different groups, um, but that that is a movement that should continue. And I'm a big fan of, I remember I was part of this group um, and, you know, they use the A, A and NHPI sort of acronym, um, but there was no like NHPI representation in the group. And so I said like, why are we still using NHPI if there's no NHPI representation? Like, what what should we do, you know? And um, now, you know, like we should just call Asian American. It's okay. Like, let's acknowledge the fact that we didn't do that. And then like, how can we in another 
instance, sort of focus the focus the group's work on NHPI um, uh, and and their community, and then do it right by bringing in folks from the NHPI community. But let's not let's not contribute. Sometimes I feel like that's a, that's another way. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but like you can like asking that question right up front, you know, at the beginning. Like if this is supposed to be ANHPI, do we have a well-represented ANHPI group of people working together and perspectives coming in? Um, yeah. Um, I'm gonna chime in with that. I, I, I think it is important that we do disaggregate. Like, I think it's great that we can help each other um, because I mean, whatever political power we can have together is always great. But again, like being intentional with the Pacific Islander community, um, even with, within the PI community, we still have those who are hyper visible, which is I'm Polynesian and I have to recognize that I have a lot more hyper vis visibility than say my Melanesian and Micronesian brothers and sisters. Um, and being cognizant of that means also highlighting them in spaces where um, they're not present. And so, where that I think that same mindset can be applied to like say in where Asian Americans are in spaces where NHPI are not um we can still advocate for each other and and learn and be intentional about learning about each other and making sure that we're in spaces and being defended because that is political power that is a political empowerment and um I think that there's one huge thing um when people are talking about disaggregating and um I think that we should, but at the same time, like there's a lot of help in history that shows that Asian Americans have helped Pacific Islanders. So we can we can acknowledge that, but also empowering our PI community and um, recognizing their issues as well. So yeah, and chiming chiming in uh, and speaking to both of you actually, like it, I think it's helpful it's helpful to ask these critical questions of how do these kinds of categorizations help or, or not our different communities. And like Vanessa's saying, even within Pacific Islander communities, it's like communities with the IES, like we're not, we're not a homogenous group at all. And we have such different histories and experiences. Um, and you know, like in, in the States, it's, it's speaking back to this idea that the Pacific is just a hole in a donut. It's this big blue like spot on a map when in actuality, we're like a third of the world and we have like over 22,000 islands and we we produce so much like cultural capital and, and all sorts of other stuff. And on top of that, we are not a homogenous group where we have different regions, um, different kind of histories and, and different relationships to each other that bring us to the say the United States for different reasons as well. So even within that categorization, it's so diverse. Um, so then when I think of this larger acronym of API, AA, NHPI, like whatever we call it, there's like so many versions of it. Um, I even think about the, the AA side. Oh no. It's like Oceania is a blue continent. And when we, lump, when we get lumped together, Oops, sorry, it says my internet's unstable. When we get lumped together, um, sometimes it can be helpful in solidarity building, but other times I'm like, does it do a disservice to all of our communities when we're just seen as this large homogenous group? When again, even within those acronyms and the bits and pieces within it, it's like, we're so diverse. Like Vanessa's experience of being Samoan is quite different from me being Chamorro in Micronesia. Even her being Samoan is not the same as being a Samoan from independent Samoa. So even within our capelagos, we have such different kinds of ways of being in relationship with one another. And I know, I know for me, like it, it, it's, it, I try to lean into that beauty, I'm trying to lean into that curiosity of the differences. Um, because I think then uh, to go back to the question I was asked, like leaning in and under, like doing my, at least in, in the leadership that I, whatever some one would say that I do, um, is that it, it, it helps inform and, and, and gets that. So recognizing and then leaning into it um, could also be ways. Um, awesome, awesome. Where do you want, where would we like to go next? Um, oh, let's get to Darren's question from the, 
from earlier. Um, so Darren asks, uh, so Darren identifies as a fourth generation Chinese American. Um, and then as we were, as this question came up while we were dialoguing around assimilation and multi-generation experience. How might one be able to connect with one's ethnic culture when one's family is so far removed from the culture? Um, and then second question, how, how might have you all fought back against your family's intergenerational trauma? I think I can speak to this, um, considering I've gone through a lot of assimilation and multi-generational experiences. Um, so I think the question is one's ethnic culture when one's family is so far removed. My parents are, I'm gonna be real, my parents are not connected to the culture whatsoever, um, but my grandparents are. And they made sure that me and my siblings understood that like, while I was being watched by my grandparents, they made sure that like, we knew what Samoan food was. We knew uh, what Samoan language sounded like. Like, and so what I would suggest, and so I haven't, they have been a great source for me, but it's also my responsibility to seek out that information. I think one thing Dr. Bennett had brought up is like, we are in an era of information. Um, seek out, you know, okay, right now I'm taking a Samoan class and a Tongan class um, through Instagram. Like, these are not formal spaces. You can go and look for them. Um, and it can be casual. It doesn't have to be. And, it, you know, I know a lot of you are probably like stacked on time, but I know a lot of you guys are also on Instagram, Facebook, that kind of thing. And it, it can be as easy as looking up like someone language group, tongue and language group. And you'd be surprised how many people are just like you searching. Um, and I found comfort in those spaces too, where people have been able to like really be like, yeah, you know, my family went through the same thing, but it's our birthright, right, to that language. Even if you're far removed, it is your birthright. Um, I think that is something that you should always also know, even if we're in America, um, that is your culture. And you can seek those things out without shame too. Um, and then your second question is how have you fought back against your family? Uh, I fought back by making it clear that like, I want to know the culture. I am my culture and I can own up to those things. And, you know, the journey is different for us all, but at the same time, I think, again, these are things that is your birthright. You can seek them out, whatever uh, source. It doesn't have to be formal. And I think that I've come to recognize that that's okay. Um, and I, I hope to push that same energy out onto the cohort and anybody who's listening who feels so far removed from culture, but also being very cognizant of culture because there are some things in America as a diaspora person that like, if I go back to the islands, you know, I have to be careful that I'm not disrespecting certain things and learning. And, you know, maybe even when COVID's not crazy, go visit your home country. Like that is another thing. Be where your ancestors were. That's what I'll say. Mm. Such a mic drop moment, I'm writing it down. That's... <laughs> um, with that, hope that's helping. Um, any other additional thoughts? Either Darren's questions are related to what Vanessa shared. Um, I, I'll just jump off of Vanessa's and then hopefully other folks say some awesome stuff too. I. Um, being a part of this group is one way of, of reaching out and being in community. Again, like what is community anyways, like communities and um, our identities are in flux all the time. So you, you make your kind of cultural experience what you want it to be, like being in this group is part of it. Um, being in, in a diasporic space is also a kind of way of feeling your, your ness, like my tomorrow ness, um, Vanessa Samoan ness, like it, this is not the same as being back in our, our home islands or our home countries or wherever our families are genealogically connected to, but this is an experience in itself that is, um, it's worth celebrating and not being so hard on yourself because this is like me growing up in San Diego, California, that is still a tomorrow experience. Um, it's just different from maybe how my parents had like experienced it or my grandmother or my cousins that are back in Guam, um, but it's, uh, it's not less valuable. So I, if anyone is, feeling worried about 
their ties to culture. It is it's the thing that's in flux and you make of it what, what you want. And it looks different depending on where your feet are. And I think context is really important to also lean into. But there's so many ways to stay connected. There are many, and not just connected, but to grow in it because some folks feel a bit distant, but again, everyone's on their journey and it's a lifetime journey. So speak to your grandparents if they're, if they're still around, um, speak to elders, they're so, generous folks are generous with their time it's just a matter of you saying something because a lot of especially older folks don't even sometimes they don't feel like they're valuable within communities either so if you go to them they're more than happy to usually to talk and like Vanessa said if we're online like like we are right now now we are all in a network together we all know of each other so don't be afraid to email folks to reach out it's all about who you know and um, you know, within these larger categories that we might be placed in because of the United States trying to make sense of these different racial groups and ethnic groups. While we can problematize it, it's again another space where you can find community. So if you are, if you fall within this acronym, like lean on folks that might be outside of your community too, and um, they can put you in contact with folks or at least be a support as maybe you and your friends start finding ways to, to grow in your connection to whatever home is right or the, the kind of genealogical spaces that you're tied to but there's creative writing that you can read and there's um, films that you can watch and there's music that you can listen to and it doesn't have to be traditional music like our our peoples uh, use all different kinds of forms of arts to express how they feel back back home again I was saying home for because for me Guam is is another space of home but um, you know the arts is a really important space to, where people are like figuring out these things together um, but home is home is wherever we are, like wherever you go, you take a bit of that with you. Um, so for me, I believe that like I grew up in San Diego, that is another space of the Mariana Islands because of that large diasporic community that we have there. And I argue that Chamorros take our islands and like push the boundaries of it wherever we go. We're the most widely dispersed Pacific group in the United States. We have more Chamorros that live outside of our islands right now than within. And I believe like we, we take that Pacificness with us wherever we are. So at the end of the day, it's again, a lifelong journey. So for all of you, I just hope that if you feel like you're not tied to your culture close enough, it, it's, a, it's a lifelong journey. And don't be so hard on yourself because your diasporic experience is, is a cultural one in that. Absolutely. We are like making the history now. Like we're, we're like, yeah, we're kind of defining it as we're going. So it, it, it can take any, any shape or variation. Um, and I'm just acknowledging what I know what uh, Steve has said in the chat. Yeah. Um, thanks for adding that perspective, Steve, to the conversation. Um, and, and I hope, I hope some of what uh, Vanessa shared and what Dr. Bennett just shared in terms of um, where it could be can, can, can spark some ideas and thoughts. Um, speaking of favorite books, documentary, so another question is like, where, what are some of those things? Uh, what is that Instagram handle, Vanessa, that you use? Um, what are some of the ways that you all are connecting to the ANHPI diaspora or its history? I know, Dale, you mentioned history. Like, what are ways that you are yeah, doing that? Um, maybe we could check it out. I'm always a plus, I'm always advocates for ethnic studies classes, but that was my two cents, you all. What, what are your ways? I know that's one of my greatest regrets is I didn't take any ethnic studies classes. So for anyone who is still in college and able to do that, um, and obviously that's something you can pursue afterwards as well. Um, one of the books that I love about immigration policy um, related to the Asian American community is um, One Mighty and Irresistible Tide. It's just an amazing documentation of the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act and also um, you know, the waves of Asian American immigration, including um, uh, more uh, war, how that contributed to refugees coming over in the 1970s. Um, so highly recommend that book. Thank you. And Lee, yeah, you I, dropping it in the chat so we can get it. Yeah, I love that book too, Lee. It, it, it does show the kind of like the long game of, of immigration history there from the 1920s to now. Uh, 
and how uh, yeah how how it has evolved over time and that there's so many actors that opened up the Immigration and Nationalization Act, uh, INA in 1965, that opened up all our, uh, our, our uh, the first generation to come to the United States, you know, from the Pacific Islands, from the Philippines, and from South Asia to, to the United States. So, so that's, I, I think that's one thing for Kapow participants is to, have a long game of things. I think it's important, Shyam, to uh, for them to stay in public service. Uh, and, 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 you know, the long game of, of of I think the long game of resistance, right? Of 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 staking our claim and stake staking our diversity and and staking our uniqueness. I think is important. But I, I, I wanted to also acknowledge one of the questions I thought was very thought provoking that we might have to, uh, the white elephant in the room is model minority myth and how all of us here in this panel have, I, I, I have to admit, I, I have to suffer through that. They always think I'm good at math in school just because I'm Asian and that I'm smart. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but it's a myth, right? And 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 because of this model minority myth, uh, is perpetuated. I think in a lot of media that you that you're, you 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 mentioned your question, Shyam, right? Uh, uh, and and how that model minority myth is 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 perpetuated. It it not only helps it helps us as as. Uh, a P N H I, but also it hurts other groups as well because it makes them like, well, they made it. How come you can't make it? You follow me, and so it it bifurcates, and and it's part of that. It it just accentuates more of that racism and xenophobia that Lee mentioned at the top of the hour. Yeah, definitely. Good. One book that I'd like to recommend. It's like actually a collection of poetry. Um, and it's called Interim by Des Spicer Orak. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, but it kind of is, it's from the Palauan perspective of uh, identity um, in Palaus and Micronesia, just for those who don't know. Um, and looking at identity, um, religion and that that uh, experience, because I think one thing in the Pacific that's a huge um, culture is also religion. Uh, it's deeply in a lot of our, um, in our islands. So um, for those who are interested in reading that, that one's pretty good. And I believe it's not too long. So something you can light read and then also uh, do your own thing at the same time. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I guess relatedly, right, uh, the first question that was dropped in the Q&A, and if you have questions, feel free to send it through the chat or the Q&A, um, the, the audience that's out there. Like, what about this idea that other, like, people who aren't within the community are consuming some of our, consuming some media or representation or, or observing some of that in the movies that are coming out, um, but then may not totally understand it or kind of like making making fun of it. Um, when when you're in those spaces or when you hear some of that, um, how do you all respond? Um, it, bef before I respond to that question, I was just gonna share a couple of resources too for yeah. folks, if, if that's okay. Um, one, one thing in terms of Pacific movement and migration, it's, so within the larger field of Pacific studies or Pacific and indigenous studies, um, talking about diasporic experiences is a growing part of this, this conversation. So um, for instance, where I come from, a lot of the, the scholarship that's talking about this unprecedented movement of our peoples that has happened probably like at the late 60s into the 70s and has really exploded since then, hasn't had um, 
uh, too much written about it yet. A lot of the work is looking still within the home islands, but there's not a lot about our diasporic experiences and by and large for Pacific peoples that's kind of represented in the literature as well. Um, so like Vanessa sharing um, poetry, there, there's quite a lot, again, our arts are really strong in talking about these kinds of movement and diasporic experiences. And then you're starting to see the growth of these conversations within academic spaces as well. So two poets who are also, our people are really into poetry um, and a lot of our academics are also poets in their own right. And I think that's part of the, the trauma of like having to do this kind of discussion and research about our peoples. But um, I was gonna recommend uh, Marsha Lee's uh, poet, uh, Kathy Jetnell Kitchener. She is um, a PhD student at uh, ANU, so Australian National University. Uh, she grew up in the Marshalls and in, in Hawaii. So um, she's had dice work experiences in different spaces. She has, um, she has a book out, but what I would recommend, because reading is great, but it's also to, it nice to consume this kind of um, work and discussion in other formats as well. So if you just look her up on YouTube, she has very, she has beautiful poetry that's also with video and you can hear her perform it, which I think has a different kind of power to it. Um, she has poetry, <clears throat> 10 lessons that I learned. I think it's called 10 lessons I learned living in Hawaii where she talks about the racism she experienced within this larger group of being Micronesian. Um, so you can hear like what it's a specific kind of context of what it's like to be diasporic within the Pacific because we have diasporic experiences even within Oceania. Um, so I would check her out. She has really be beautiful poetry. Um, there's also Dr. Craig Santos Perez. Uh, he is a Chamorro scholar. He has a book that just came out called Navigating Chamorro Poetry, but um, his blog and some of his poetry books really grapples with our movements. And even on his blog, I he has one in particular I could put in the chat where he just writes a list of like a hundred ways, a hundred ways I deal with being homesick. And um, which is kind of, again, the diversity of experiences. Like I was born and raised in the continental US and he was born and raised in Guam and then moved later in life. So he has a list um, that's really fun to read and how you can find other ways of connecting to your peoples even when you're physically removed from that context. And then finally, my last one, um, Dr. David Iona Chang, who's based out of the University of uh, Minnesota. He is a Hawaiian scholar and his book is called The World and All the Things Upon It, um, Native Hawaiian Geographies. So speaking to this idea that even though Pacific peoples are moving in in big waves right now in ways that we haven't experienced before in our histories, um, in recent histories, uh, he goes, well, let me tell you about a Hawaiian experience where we've always been a very mobile people, <clears throat> which is um, how the region itself has always been. Like mobility is at the heart of who we are because of the way that we peopled our our continent. So he's a great resource if you want to have a more scholarly engagement with Pacific movements from specifically a Hawaiian perspective. But yeah, you, you, there's a Hawaiian, a Chamorro, and a Marshallese option for you all. I did the thing where I started Googling <laughs> because I didn't want to lose all these really great um, uh, titles. This is amazing. Um, yes. Yeah, keep keep dropping into the chat. This is a community. We all have something to offer. So if you have other recommendations um, for anybody, uh, let's let's uh, let's add it to the list. All right. Well, we're 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 coming to the end um, of the conversation here. Um, I thought maybe we could end on these last two questions. So getting back to this idea of like, how might and how might we um, just work with folks who may not know about our communities or see our communities and sort of make fun of it? Um, how, how might we wanna work with them or talk to them or if you've had those experiences, what are some of the things that you do? And then yeah, if, if anyone has an answer to that. And then I think we can end on that on the question that was at 640 in terms of like what are you, what are we all trying to preserve or would like um, like to share? Um, I'll answer the first question about how do you feel about the many movies coming out that show intergenerational trauma experiences? I think that those are important, right? Like I uh, I don't. I think one thing that we all share in the AAPI community is that 
uh, mental health is not something that's always addressed. Uh, they're, they're new concepts, at least for a lot of our older, um, well, at least in my family, because I don't want to generalize, but um, mental health is something that, that wasn't previously always addressed. And I think um, when we address those things and movies show them, they could be kind of like a gateway to a conversation that's hard to have. Um, so in those senses, I think um, those have been good and helpful. What do you think that, that does for our community? I think it can kind of shape our community in this new, and not in a, but it needs fixing, but adding another element of, of care and love um, that we don't quite have yet in that aspect of mental health, right? And then what should we do? Officers do not understand it, sort of make fun of it. Okay, I wish I could say that I was kind enough to be understanding to every single person who's misunderstood my culture, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes I have a more visceral reaction. Well, at first I'll be quite offended, but as I've gotten older, I tend to, to be more understanding. Depends on what they're misunderstanding though. Um, but for the most part, if they're making fun of it, I've always now, before I used to not be so, so vocal about my, uh, about standing up for myself, but it's important too, because that really sets the standard for how these same people will then address other people of your culture. And, um, and I think say somebody comes up to me and says something bad about Samoans or something or Samoans, well, now I'm going to stop it and, uh, hit on the head. Because if I don't, they'll continue to make that same type of um, comment or act against other Samoans and I just or other PIs. And I think that that is something that, if you can stop, you should. Um, and it doesn't always have to be a calling somebody out. It could be calling somebody in too, um, and really being like, "Hey, yeah, that's not okay. You shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do that. It's not. It's not cool." to my culture or it's not cool to any person of color. Um, so you can have constructive conversations, but also uh, definitely being a big reminder to people that they can't treat you like they, they used to and they shouldn't feel comfortable doing so too. Yeah, that's how, how I'll answer for that question. I definitely agree with everything you, you're saying, Vanessa. Um, I also think too that um, it, it is, this is like where self-care and per, preserve, uh, was it, preservation can also come in in terms of like making that choice. Like part of being part of a community is that no one person needs to represent everyone in the community. So if it's safe to do so, if it's, if it's in a point that, um, you know, people might be listening, like you think somebody will be able to listen or you'll be able to engage with them in a, in a conversation, then like it, it, that choice is always there for, um, for all of us. And so, um, yeah, yeah. But some, some things I think about too. And then like the, the way your time or like that might get you to think about how you might want to spend your time, right? Like the, the causes you take up, either in or outside of your work or in school or the way you or the way one might like yeah interests all of that kind of stuff can come from that because we're built in those experiences so processing it is important but like in that moment having to respond to somebody um they don't they don't necessarily they it's not theirs for, or it's not how do you say it how would I say it like it's not them that you don't owe that to them right like what is your choice um so, yeah. yeah, I like maybe I agree, Cheyenne. I want to put a pin to what you said of, especially to a lot of the Kapal participants to practice self care, uh, and that, like I said time and time again, to look into the long game of things. If you're going to be in public service, uh, change doesn't happen within one semester or even one year, right? It takes it takes a while, and we need. Uh, smart, energetic, and uh, thoughtful folks like you to to hang in there for the long game and, and practice self care. And there's a lot of uh, unintentional self harm. I think is there, you're bombarded with all. The, I, I I I gotta be that that senior advisor uh, by thirty, 
right? Or I, I got to make that six figures by 25 or I, I you know, I, you know, cause you're bombarded by social media of, 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 you know, Instagram and everything else of success. And I have to be successful myself. And, and, that, and I, I think I, I have to call that out and that, uh, I, and, and like, like Dr. Bennett says, you define what that success is for you define what that identity is for you. And you could be a uh, Chamorro, even from San Diego, because you define that for yourself, you know? And so also define success for you uh, and, and, and practice self-care. Thank you, Al. Um, all right. Well, I think we're kind of getting towards the end here and let's, you know, let's end on this question or any other final thoughts. Um, if you're, if you're hoping to have a prompt, like, um, I think this question came back when we were talking a little bit about preserving culture and kind of like how culture was morphing between generations. So, um, you know, you could take it there. Like, what is something about your culture that you're hoping to preserve? Or you can also look ahead, you can, and you can also look ahead um, and to think about like, what would you want the culture to be or the culture to look like? Um, and you can keep it as specific or broad um, as, as, as whatever your heart speaks to. Um, Dale, you're on my screen, so we can start with you. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Well, it's, I think it's, it, it, uh, you know, it's important that, like I said, to, uh, for for folks that are uh, join us uh, for this webinar and who are seeing it in, uh, along is to play the long game and to take care of yourself, but also, uh, you know, stake your claim in what's that, those cultural values and that unique identity that you have as an AAPNHI and that, um, and, and, to, and to have, uh, yeah, and, and, and to uh, to find out those core values that drive you to public service, I think is, is, is important. Thank you. Lee, Vanessa, Dr. Bryant, would you like to go next? Either one. I can go next. Um, I think something that I really want to preserve or something um is like we are very 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 family oriented um pacific islanders but i i think that that is something that i that i always want to keep with me my family's always driven me and and i think um if i could preserve that that is something um more serious that i would hope a community and i think that goes into public service right and always staying grounded in in those things um so that is for that on a serious note, but on a lighter note, I would really love to preserve our food. I think that is something that I, I still need to learn. Um, I'm coming along, but yeah, definitely preserve our food. And then that cultural dynamic of family being, our community being something that um, we work for and in. Yeah, definitely echo the comment about food. Um, I also feel like going back to what we were discussing about language um, and just thinking in like the context of things like elections and things like that, just language access being something that um, I would love to preserve and also honestly just have baseline. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that I'm hoping to see, you know, more lawmakers, more campaigns focus on moving forward. Uh, I, th I think for me, uh, what I would hope to, to preserve, um, it, there's, there's a couple of things. One, I'm hoping to preserve this idea of like whatever your ness is, like my tomorrow ness and, and that kind of specific feeling of it where I grew up, that kind of context-based identity. Um, I, I, I hope, I guess it's more of a takeaway, but I hope that folks are, again, just easy on themselves because we're all trying to make sense of um, of our, our people's stories and sorry if my internet is unstable again yeah, right. um but yeah just 
I hope people are easy on themselves. Like for me, I took the academic route to understand like, why is it that I have this accent? And why is it that I grew up in a city that has so many tomorrows? Yes, yet we are so hyper invisible. Um, we have all of these support systems in these cultural so social orgs and in my house. But once I'm outside of those kind of contexts, it's like a very different experience. So I, I just say like for, for folks that are listening in, just, just be easy on yourself because we're all trying to make sense of it. And I went the academic route to try to understand um, which has opened up conversations with my family, both both fun and very difficult as well to understand like what has prompted this movement and um, you know why, why is San Diego another home for us? And I would argue another village of Guam or another island of the Marianas. Um, I, I would also, I guess to preserve things is this kind of care for community, which um, we are very family oriented as well. And sometimes we call it like a coconut network because our families aren't a nuclear family, it's intergenerational. And this coconut network is like something that also keeps me very much connected to folks wherever I am. Like, hey, did, did you know so-and-so is in this place? Hey, you should have so-and-so's cousins, whatever is in this place. So I know here in New Zealand where I, I'm here just for work, you know, um, and, and being here, I know of the seven tomorrows that are here because of this, this strong kind of network that we have amongst each other. So um, I think that's really important that we, we keep going. And, and with this kind of network um, and the spreading of, of our peoples, of Pacific peoples around various continents at this point as well, um, this love for, for our home islands, um, specifically for, for Pacific folks, it's, um, you know, we have such pride and that's been instilled with me because of my grandma. Every day I left the house, she would give me a kiss and be like, you know, make good friends, don't do drugs and don't forget your tomorrow. And she would say that every time I left the house, like it was always, don't forget your tomorrow, don't forget. And I think that's also instilled this kind of responsibility in me to, to my home islands. So even if I physically don't live there, like I am very much invested in, um, you know, these new political futures that our, our peoples are trying to build in real time to have the right to self-determination and things like that. So um, while some diasporic communities that, you know, folks here might be tied to might have left in and maybe in some ways have cut ties, I don't know. But for some of us, for indigenous folks, at least like it's it's a lot of cyclical movement and it's a lot of back and forth and it's it's all of that and more. So I really hope that um, that doesn't get lost either is this love for place, even if you're not physically there. Um, we, we inherit these memories of these places from our family members. And I think that that's really important that we keep close. And, and if folks are fighting for things back home that we at least have an ear to the ground to try to figure out how can we support in the States? Because for some of us, we can vote in the States, but those back home cannot. So things like that, um, the love for place, love for people and to be easy on ourselves. Yeah. Beautifully said. Um, from you, Dr. Bennett, all our panelists, Lee, Vanessa, Dale, thank you so much um, for offer offering your, your thoughts and perspectives and just your honest, honest, yeah, your honesty for where you are today. Um, I hope all the audience members can just know that like, they, like they're not alone and that there's a community out there and um, whoever you may reach out to, whoever is part of that community um, can offer something and you can offer something to them too. And that's what makes this work. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for, for being with uh, me and the rest of the panelists tonight. Um, it was a very great time, at least from my perspective. Um, and I hope you had a great time too. I'm going to pass it over to Kobe to close us out. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, team. Thank you, panel. Um, you know, I, I will just say, and speaking specifically really to our, our scholars and interns, our cohort for 2022 who are with us tonight, you know, just as the panel said, just as Sham eloquently said, we hope Kapal is a place for you to be together, uh, to, to share your histories, to talk identity, uh, to share food, to share culture and, and books and literature and the latest, um, and we're, we're with you on that journey week to week. So thank you, Sham, Dale, our 2021 intern, Vanessa, for being on our panel, Lee, Dr. Jesse, our opening speakers, Crystal, and Congresswoman Chu for the thoughtful conversation tonight. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. If this was your first WLP session of the summer, we've got five more coming right at you. Uh, they're every Wednesday, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on Zoom with us. They'll also be uh, live streamed on Facebook, and the recordings will be on Facebook in case you miss us, or you want to pass it to your friends, and you want to rehash something that was said. Uh, next week's WLP is Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, AA and NHPI Leaders in Public Service. Well, we'll talk about navigating the workplace as an AA NHPI, and particularly 
within the public sector. You can register on our website at kapal.org and view all of the upcoming events there. You can also find that information uh, on any of our social media platforms at Kapal DC. Thank you again to our 2022 sponsors for your continued support of our programs. Thank you to our WLP planning committee. Thank you to Hannah and to Carmen for helping staff tonight and making sure everything went smoothly. Uh, we so appreciate you. And thank you all for taking time tonight to join us for the very first WLP session of the summer. We'll see you next week. Good night.